Hi, I'm Dick Miller. I teach in the philosophy department and I'm director of the program in ethics and public life. This is the second lecture in the ethics and public life series on deep issues of the 2012 elections. One of the deepest issues posed by these elections is the nature and value of the American electoral process itself. Does the political process in the United States realize democratic values? How well does it track justice? In our first lecture, Jacob Packer raised the question of whether American politics undermines the American dream and offered some disturbing answers. Many of us have worried that the American political process does not uphold these values, does not realize democratic ideals. Many of us have worried, but Larry Bartels, our speaker today, has done more than worry in wide-ranging investigations that are both profoundly imaginative and deeply empirically grounded. He has identified and confirmed interactions between economic inequality and the political process in the United States. He's reshaped our understanding of the interaction between those two aspects of life in the United States. So he will continue our investigation of the profound questions about inequality and democracy raised by the political process that we're now going through. Michael Jones Correa of the Government Department will now introduce Larry Bartels, who will then give us his lecture on the topic, Unequal Democracy. My honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Larry Bartels to you today. Uh, he's one of uh, the political scientists I most admire, uh, and, and I was lucky to have a chance to uh, get to know him the year I spent in Princeton uh, as part of his uh, Center for the Study of Democratic Politics. Larry began his career at Rochester. Uh, he was an assistant professor there and an associate professor before moving to Princeton for uh, 20 years. Uh, he left Princeton for Vanderbilt. He is now uh, the uh, Shane Chair of Public Policy and Social Science. His work uh, has ranged through uh, study of American democracy, public opinion, electoral politics, public policy, and representation, uh, with his particular interest in how unequal resources shapes access and representation, which is what we'll be hearing about today. Um, his most recent work, uh, Unequal Democracy, The Political Economy of the Gilded Age, which is from 2008, uh, was recently uh, cited by President Obama on the campaign trail, uh, which is an endorsement, uh, you know, the best endorsement you probably get. Um, uh, he appeared on David Leonhardt's list of economic books of the year in the New York Times, and, and uh, in addition, uh, won the Gladys M. Kammerer Award for the, the year's best book on U.S. national policy. He's uh, co-edited books on campaign reform, authored a second book on presidential primaries, written another 20 or so articles in leading journals in political science, and uh, a dozen or so book chapters. Uh, so he's uh, been very busy. Um, Larry has been and uh, is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. He's been a vice president of the American Political Science Association. Um, and as I mentioned uh, as well, director uh, and founder of the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School, uh, where, um, where I first uh, had a chance to spend some time with him. Um, I learned there that Larry is not only a very careful listener, a sharp questioner, and a great colleague, uh, he also follows basketball very closely. Uh, runs a very competitive, a very fun basketball pool in playoff season. Um, uh, which is just another way of saying that he's a key builder of communities and institutions wherever he is. 
Uh, so please join me today in welcoming Larry Bartels of Vanderbilt University. Uh, for Thank you, Michael. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today, and I'm heartened that so many of you have come out on the last day of summer in Ithaca to hear this talk about weighty issues. I hope my talk will speak to the theme of your series on the 2012 election. I'm going to be talking mostly about this book that Michael mentioned that was written in 2008 called Unequal Democracy, the Political Economy of the New Gilded Age. Of course, those of you who have been paying attention to what's been going on in the world realize that um, a lot of interesting stuff has happened just in the last four years since this book was published. And so one of the things that I'm just starting to think about and hope I can get your help in thinking about today is uh, how the argument of the book has held up and what kinds of changes in the analysis and argument are appropriate in light of what we've all lived through over the past four years. And at least for the moment, my uh, working thought is uh, that with all that's happened over the last four years, the new Gilded Age is not really any less gilded than it was uh, as I described it, but let's see what you think as we go along. I want to start with Aristotle, just to show the philosophers in the room that this is a long-standing and deep set of political issues. What differentiates oligarchy and democracy is wealth or the lack of it. The essential point is that where the possession of political power is due to the possession of economic power or wealth, whether the number of persons be large or small, that is oligarchy, and when the unpropertied class have power, that is democracy. This connection between economic power and political power is one that has posed a real challenge to people who think about political systems ever since Aristotle's time. We talked a little bit at dinner last night about a recent book about Machiavelli and Machiavelli's views about how the Italian city-states could rein in their oligarchs and produce a political system that worked on behalf of ordinary people. Uh, all through American history, this issue has, has loomed large as well. And it's one that is, as you'll see, uh, more important now probably than it has been at any point in recent American history. It's one that's gotten some attention uh, among ordinary Americans, especially over the last uh, couple of years, the Occupy Wall Street movement and related political debates. Uh, President Obama, in his big speech in Kansas last December, uh, last December, talked about this as the defining issue of our time. This kind of gaping inequality gives the lie to the promise that's at the very heart of America, that this is a place where you can make it if you try. And of course, there's been talk about this issue on the other side as well. This is from Mitt Romney in January. You know, I think it's about envy. I think it's about class warfare. It's fine to talk about these things in quiet rooms and discussions about tax policy and the like. Um, he, as you know, talked about this some in a room that he thought was quiet uh, a few months ago that turned out not to be so quiet. But if you'll stay fairly quiet over the next half hour or so, I'll talk about it as well. So here's a picture that I think is useful to orient yourself to the American political economy in the era since World War II. Um, what I'm showing you here is the record of real income growth for American families at different parts of the income distribution. And so the bars in each of these two graphs run from the 20th percentile of the income distribution. So this is working poor people, not in abject poverty, but near the bottom of the income distribution. The 40th and 60th percentiles are middle class, middle income people. The 80th percentile, fairly affluent people. And then near the top at the 95th percentile, uh, the people who are doing pretty well with respect to their economic circumstances. And what these bars show you is simply how much the incomes of each of those groups grew in real terms in the first and second halves of the post-World War II period. And you can see that there's a very substantial difference between the two periods. In the first part of this period, in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a good deal of real income growth, and it was pretty widely distributed across the entire income distribution. Now remember, these are percentage changes, and so in absolute terms, the incomes of the people at the top were increasing substantially faster than the incomes of the people at the bottom. But in terms of percentage growth, 
you see that there was a pretty, lar a pretty fast and pretty uh, equal growth in incomes over that period. In the second half of the post-war period, the pattern has been very different in two respects. One is that the overall level of income growth has been a lot lower, and the other is that the gains have been distributed much more unequally. So people at the top have had about half the income growth that they had in the first period, uh, and people at the bottom have had vastly less than they had. And so you see a pretty pronounced slope here with respect to percentage increases, much less absolute increases. Meanwhile, if we get closer to the top of the income distribution, looking at the top 5% or the top 1%, and think about how they've done, not in absolute terms, but as a share of the overall pie, you see that there's been a big change going even further back in time. These are from data from the Internal Revenue Service that go back to the beginning of the income tax in the early 20th century. And what's being charted here is on the top, the share of total income that goes to the top 5% of the income distribution. And then the dotted line on the bottom is the share that goes to the top 1% of the income distribution. And so one thing you can see here is the big run up in the shares of those two groups over the last 30 years or so. And I want you to notice especially that those two lines, the two increases, seem to be pretty parallel. What is that telling you? Well, it's telling you that the people between the top 5% and the top 1%, so this is from the 95th to the 99th percentile, haven't really changed their share of the income pie all that much over this period. The real increase has come from the people in the top 1% uh, who've made big gains over this period. There's a drop off at the end of this picture here that corresponds to the dot-com bust. Another one uh, will show up, although it's not uh, entirely apparent here yet, the recovery from the most recent drop in income shares of these top people, which is due to the Great Recession and the Wall Street meltdown. Um, but their income shares are now back on the rise in case you were worried about them. The other thing to see about this is that if we go back through history, the absolute level of inequality in terms of income shares here in the current period is quite comparable to what we observed in the 1920s, which was the last big period of economic inequality in American history. We don't have similar kinds of data from the original Gilded Age in the late 19th century, so I don't know how these peaks correspond to that one, but at least over the course of the last century or so, um, there's never been a time where inequality was much different than, excuse me, was much higher than, than it is right now. So why is that? Well, economists have written a lot about various causes of this shift in the distribution of incomes. Uh, they pointed to technological changes and how different people and different kinds of the, uh, occupations are likely to have their services become more or less valuable as a result of these technological changes. Globalization has made a big difference. There have been demographic shifts in terms of the structure of families and so on. I think all of those things are relevant, but what economists often overlook is that there are also political factors that I think play a very important role in changing patterns of income distribution over time. One way to think about the effects of these political factors and of public policy generally is to think about what's happened in other developed countries over this same period of time. Obviously, the United States is not the only place that's experienced technological change and globalization and demographic shifts. So we can look around at the rest of the world and see what's happened there. And the general trend to present it in a very summary form is that inequality has increased in all of these other countries but not to the same degree as in the United States. And more importantly, there's been much more political response and policy response to changing patterns of inequality in most of these countries, so that if you look at the distribution of incomes after taxes and transfers, they've done more to reduce inequality in most other wealthy countries than in the United States. Another way to think about this is just to look at the differences in patterns of inequality as a function of who's in charge in the political system. And so one of the things that I've done is to look at how the pattern of income growth that I showed you for people in different parts of the income distribution has looked different under Democratic and Republican presidents in this whole period since World War II. And it turns out that there are some pretty substantial differences that reflect in, I think, a sensible way the different priorities that the parties have espoused over long periods of time. 
Certainly the Republican Party now is not the same thing as the Republican Party in the 1950s. And for that matter, the Democratic Party now is not the same thing as the Democratic Party in the 1950s. But on the whole, there have been pretty consistent differences in their ideological commitments and in their core constituencies that you would expect to affect what they're trying to produce in the way of public policy. And it seems that at least to some extent they have had quite uh, important effects on income distributions. So here's my tabulation of income growth over the entire periods from 1948 when these data that I'm looking at from the Census Bureau begin until 2009. Um, looking again at my people at the 20th percentile, the 40th percentile, 60th, 80th, and 95th, since those are the way the data are reported by the Census Bureau. And all I'm showing you here is the average rate of real income growth for people in those different parts of the income distribution. The solid line at the top is under Democratic presidents, and the dotted line at the bottom is under Republican presidents. And so you can see that these are very different patterns. The people near the top of the distribution do pretty well regardless of which party is in charge. And in fact, if we push out using different kinds of data to the far right end to the even more affluent people, it looks as though that's the case, that there really isn't much partisan difference in their economic experiences. But if you move back in the distribution to the middle, you see that there's a very substantial difference in how well middle class families have done under Democratic and Republican presidents with much more real income growth under Democrats than under Republicans. And if you move even further to the left to the 20th percentile, these working poor families, incomes have grown about 10 times as fast under Democratic presidents as they have under Republican presidents during this period. If you think about the long run implications of those kinds of shifts in patterns of income growth, we're talking about small percentage numbers, right? A couple of percent if in a given year. How much difference does that make over time? Well, here's a kind of tracing of hypothetical patterns of inequality over the entire post-war period under the sorts of growth patterns that we've observed, in fact, for Republicans and for Democrats. So the dotted line in the center here is the actual growth in inequality as measured by the ratio of incomes at the 80th percentile to the 20th percentile. So that's what's actually happened. The little circles along the bottom are the estimates of what would have happened if the pattern that we've actually observed under Democratic presidents had been in effect through this entire post-war period. And there you see that in spite of all the technological, demographic, globalization changes that economists have pointed to, the estimates are that overall inequality would actually have decreased some in the post-war period. And then the line at the top is the corresponding estimate imposing the Republican pattern on years even when we didn't have Republican presidents. And you can see that there the run-up in inequality is much greater than the one that we've actually observed. I don't know what the level of inequality is in the kinds of places that Americans like to refer to as banana republics, but that's the set kind of numbers that we're talking about up here at the top. So what accounts for those differences? What is it that Republican and Democratic presidents are doing differently that has such a big impact on people's life circumstances and economic prospects? One is that there are big differences in macroeconomic policies and performance between Democrats and Republicans if you look at things like unemployment and economic growth. There are big differences in tax policies, talk a little bit about those, and differences in a variety of policies regarding social spending and labor regulations and minimum wage laws and so on. So I want to just talk a little bit about each of those three. Here's the record of performance with respect to unemployment and inflation and GMP growth, basically overall economic growth under Republican and Democratic presidents over this whole post-war period. And you can see that there isn't much difference with respect to inflation. The average rate of inflation is about the same under Democrats and Republicans. You can also look at the change in the inflation rate from year to year and find that that doesn't differ much between Republicans and Democrats either. But there's a pretty substantial difference in the average unemployment rate. Um, people who've only been politically aware through the Obama administration are often surprised to find that Historically, unemployment has been substantially lower under Democratic presidents than it has been under Republican presidents. Meanwhile, overall economic growth has been substantially higher under Democratic presidents than it has been under Republican presidents. 
And those differences are important because unemployment and overall economic growth are the things that matter most to the incomes of these middle class and working poor people. If you look at how changes in their income relate to these economic factors, you find, for example, that when the unemployment rate is higher, the incomes of people near the bottom of the income distribution are substantially lower. They experience much less in the way of income gains, whereas the incomes of people at the top are relatively insensitive to fluctuations in the unemployment rate. That's not too surprising because mostly they're not the kinds of people who are likely to become unemployed in a recession. On the other hand, inflation is something that matters a lot to the real incomes of people at the top of the income distribution, but really doesn't have nearly as much effect on the real incomes of middle class and poor people. So the kinds of economic performance that Democrats seem to be better at are the ones that translate most directly into real income gains for middle class and poor people. Tax policies, if you look back over the last few administrations and think about what they've done with respect to taxes, um, when Bill Clinton came into office, his first budget raised taxes on rich people at the same time a substantial expansion of the earned income tax credit for the working poor, which was not originally a democratic idea, but which is one that Democrats have fastened on and used to make the real circumstances of poor people better than they otherwise would be. It's probably the most important single anti-poverty policy we have nowadays. Um, when President Bush came into office, he had a very different strategy. The first thing he did in the spring of 2001 was to push through Congress a huge tax cut. Um, that was motivated in part by the fact that uh, President Clinton had actually generated a budget surplus for the first time in a long time. People were worried about what we were going to do with this budget surplus. And so President Bush's idea was that we should give it back to people by cutting taxes. Uh, he did that and then some. There was another round of tax cuts in 2003. By that point, there was no budget surplus anymore, and so the rationale for that one was somewhat different. But together, those two tax cuts under the first Bush administration reduced the federal tax burden for taxpayers in the top 1% by about a quarter, and the tax burden for people in the bottom 95% by about 10%. Now, those two numbers are sufficiently different that by themselves, they should tell you that this was a policy that was heavily skewed toward the interests of affluent people. But in order to do a full accounting of the implications of this for people's well-being, you have to look at the other side as well. Um, what happened under President Bush was that there was a big run-up in the budget deficit. That's something that we're still wrestling with. That in itself isn't costly to anyone in a concrete way, but eventually, presumably, that budget deficit is going to be paid off through higher taxes or through lower levels of government spending than would otherwise be the case since the government spending disproportionately benefits people near the bottom of the income distribution, my guess is that the actual disparity in their net benefit or cost of these tax cuts is gonna turn out to be even more significant than the difference between 25% and 10%. So there's the politics of the tax cuts. This is uh, the inspiration for an article that I wrote that then became part of the book called Homer Gets a Tax Cut. For those of you who haven't seen the clip from the new uh, Simpsons episode where Homer goes to vote, I recommend that to you as well. I don't have that in here. You'll see how he, how he voted in 2012. Meanwhile, if you think about the other side of the income distribution, people down toward the bottom, one of the things that's most important to their economic prospects is what's happened to the minimum wage. And you can see this solid line at the bottom here traces the real value of the minimum wage over the period since the late 1940s. You can see a not very steady but substantial increase in the real value of the minimum wage through the late 1960s, paralleling the increase in real incomes. I don't know if you can see that dotted line up at the top, which is the average hourly wage in the American economy as a whole. You can see both are increasing more or less in tandem from the late 40s to the mid or late 1960s, and then at that point, actual wages in the economy flatten, there's a pl big plateau there. Meanwhile, the real value of the minimum wage actually has declined substantially. There's a uptick at the end, the most recent minimum wage increase uh, in 2007, which isn't shown on this graph, but we're still well below where we were in the 1960s with respect to the real value of the minimum wage. 
And that's despite the fact that throughout this period, I don't know of any opinion poll conducted in the last 50 years in which there wasn't a pretty strong public majority support for increasing the minimum wage. So whatever this is, it's not that the public isn't supportive of this idea. It's that their enthusiasm for increasing the minimum wage doesn't very often get translated into policy. So there's the minimum wage. Okay, so this raises the question, why are so many people voting for Republicans if, by my argument, they're doing so much worse under Republicans than they are under Democrats? This is where the politics come in, maybe the 2012 election, I don't know. I want to consider a variety of possible explanations. One is that people are voting not on the basis of economics, either their own personal economic experience or even economic policy issues, but rather on the basis of other things, cultural wedge issues, guns and abortion and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of literature about white working class voters and um, how they're hoodwinked into supporting Republicans on the basis of these issues that they oughtn't to be paying attention to. I don't think there's really much to that story if you actually look at it. Um, low income white voters are more reliably democratic now than they used to be. And they at actually attach less weight to cultural and social issues than more affluent white voters do. So the people who are mostly voting on the basis of these issues are people who are relatively affluent and well-educated and on average socially liberal. So it's not obvious to me at all that that's been a net gain to the Republican Party. The second possibility that people often raise is that Americans just don't care about inequality. I mean, they may care about the overall level of economic performance, but they don't really care much about economic inequality per se. I don't think that's actually the case either. Certainly if you take seriously what they say in surveys, they have lots of very egalitarian things to say uh, about how society should be. Here's one I like. Our society should do whatever is necessary to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed. If you think about what that actually would imply in the way of policy change, it would be quite a radical agenda. We certainly wouldn't have locally financed public schools, for example. There's no way that that kind of system can give everyone an equal opportunity to succeed. So at least at the level of principle, I think that people are pretty substantially uh, egalitarians. But I think where the problem comes in is in translating those egalitarian sentiments into actual policy preferences. And so one of the things I've done in the work that I've done looking at patterns of public support for the Bush tax cuts or for a state tax repeal is to see to what extent these kinds of principles actually figure in people's preferences. And the answer is not very much. There's a lot of disconnection and even misconnection between what people want and what they prefer in the way of specific policies. The third possibility that is not much talked about but that I want to raise for your consideration has to do with what I call partisan biases in economic accountability. And in particular, what I'm going to do here is to fasten on a peculiarity in the way voters behave that has been recognized for a long time in the political science literature, but its political implications, I think, have not really been focused on all that much. That is that you know, many of you, I'm sure, have heard in the context of the current election that if the economy is in good shape, Obama's going to do well, and if the economy is doing badly, Obama's going to lose. Um, there's a lot of evidence for that proposition, but what often gets lost in the statement of it is the fact that all of these assessments of the relationship between economic conditions and election outcomes focus on economic conditions in the year of the election or even in a shorter period, the months running up to election day, rather than on what's happened over the course of a president's entire administration. And it turns out that that psychological quirk on the part of voters, what I call myopia, has important implications for how elections actually turn out. <clears throat> In particular, I showed you that pattern of income growth for middle class and working poor families under Democratic and Republican presidents and it looked like they were all doing much better under Democrats than under Republicans. That turns out not to be the case in presidential election years. So the graph on the left is the same one that you saw before. The graph on the right is exactly the same calculation, but only looking at years in which there are presidential elections. You see that the slopes of the two lines are 
at least roughly similar. There's a lot more noise on the right because we're just looking at a handful of years now rather than the whole 65 year period. Um, you can see a slope with respect to each of those lines, but the thing that's politically important is that the relative position of the two lines has reversed entirely. So even middle class people now are doing better under Republican presidents than they are under Democratic presidents in presidential election years. And even the working poor families near the bottom of the distribution are doing about as well under Republican presidents as they are under Democratic presidents. Even though over their entire course of their administrations, Republicans are doing much less well for those people than Democrats are. So insofar as these voters are focusing on how things are going in the presidential election year, that disparity produces a huge bonus. That alone probably accounts for three of the Republican presidencies of the post-war era. This would not be a surprise to psychologists, and it would not be a surprise to Ostrogorsky, who was a visiting political scientist, I guess you would have called him from the very early 20th century, who came to the United States and wrote, of all the races in an advanced stage of civilization, the American is the least accessible to long views. Always and everywhere in a hurry to get rich, he does not give a thought to remote consequences. He sees only present advantages. He does not remember, he does not feel, he lives in a materialist dream. Well, 2008 was a pretty notable exception to that pattern. We had a Republican president in the White House and the economy was not booming. That's included in the calculations that I showed you, so that difference is not enough to change the overall pattern with respect to partisanship and income growth. But it did make a big difference to the 2008 election. By election day, about half of Americans said the national economy was poor, in poor shape, uh, and about half strongly disapproved of President Bush's performance. That made it very hard for any Republican to win, and in fact, the Republican did not win. But the thing that I want to point out to you here is that the outcome of the 2008 election is very consistent with the historical pattern that we've observed between how the economy is going at election time and how well the incumbent party does. And so all the talk you heard at the time about how this was a transformative election and the country had suddenly become more liberal and that the electorate had changed in a way that would make it hard for Republicans to win in the future, I think is maybe true, hard to say, but certainly not necessary to account for the outcome of the 2008 election. I think the way to think about it is that Obama was elected because people were unhappy with Bush because the economy was in bad shape uh, on election day. Nevertheless, however we got President Obama, we did get President Obama, and so I want to say a little bit about how he's addressed the issue of inequality, what that has to do with the argument of my book and also its implications for the political system and our political economy. The first thing President Bush did when he took office was to ram through Congress uh, a massive fiscal stimulus began spring 2009, um, much larger than anything that had been discussed through the course of 2008, even by Democrats, although it was also much smaller than what a lot of Democrat observers and Democratic members of Congress were arguing for by the time President Obama actually took office. Uh, the size of the stimulus was really constrained, importantly, by the opposition of Republicans in Congress. They needed three Republican votes in the Senate to get the stimulus through. They spent a lot of time haggling with the people who might vote for it. As a result, the stimulus got smaller and the composition of the stimulus was shifted so that there was less spending and more tax cuts. They went exactly as far as they had to go in order to get those three votes. Passed the stimulus, it then took effect. Uh, voters were mostly unhappy with it. The stimulus is still quite unpopular. But by the estimates of economists, have made a huge difference to the depth of the recession and the extent to which we have already so far recovered from the Great Recession. Um, so Alan Blinder is a prominent Democratic economist. Mark Zandi was uh, one of McCain's economists in 2008. They got together and came up with this calculation about how the stimulus package affected the economy. And their estimate is that GDP was about 1.3% higher in 2009 than it would have been, and about 2% higher in 2010 than it would have been, just on the basis of the stimulus package. Then there were lots of additional policy responses 
by the Federal Reserve that had even bigger effects. Um, some of that presumably would have happened under a Republican president, but I think not nearly as much as was actually done. Then Obama turned to health care and spent most of the second year of his administration trying to push through health care reform. Again, lots of messy compromising with the people whose votes he needed in the Senate in order to get this done. Lots of complaints from the left that the policy didn't go far enough and that there were all sorts of complex kludges that were built into the policy uh, that were going to make it work less effectively. Nevertheless, it did happen. And I think, although people have talked a lot about its significance as a social welfare policy, they focused less on the extent to which it constitutes uh, an important redistribution. So David Lanehart wrote in the New York Times after the bill passed, this was the federal government's biggest attack on economic inequality since inequality began rising more than three decades ago. It aims to smooth out one of the roughest edges in American society the inability of many people to afford medical care after they lose a job or get sick, and it would do so in large measure by taxing the rich. Certainly, if you look at what Republicans were proposing in opposition to Obama's health care reform, if you look at the adjustments in the policy that were made along the way in response to the objections of moderates in the Senate whose support was needed in order to get it through, if you look at what McCain said about health care, on the campaign trail before the 2008 election, it would be hard to suppose that anything like this would have happened under a President McCain. After the 2010 election, there was a lot of talk about changing tax policy. One of the things that President Obama has argued for for a long time is to let the top part of the Bush tax cuts for people making more than a quarter million dollars a year expire. Uh, even the Democrats in Congress were unwilling to go along with that in advance of the 2010 election. Um, but after the election in the lame duck session, there was bargaining in which the Bush tax cuts were extended in their entirety through the this year uh, in exchange for a payroll tax holiday, which is what Obama and the Democrats wanted. That reduced the taxes paid by most workers by 2% through 2011 and subsequently extended through 2012. Unlike the Bush tax cuts, which were very heavily targeted at people at the top of the income distribution, this payroll tax reduction actually is of less benefit to people at the top than it is to ordinary working people because the payroll tax is only collected up to a certain level of income. I think it's $111,000 this year. And so people whose incomes go beyond that level aren't getting the 2% reduction in tax on the rest of their income, whereas ordinary working people are getting 2% uh, right off the top of the deduction from their checks every month. Uh, I said this, repealing the Bush tax cuts for top income earners. That was not something that actually was accomplished in 2010. It may be accomplished in 2013. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Here's some data about people's preferences about what should happen with the Bush tax cuts. These are from surveys conducted just before the 2008 election, just before the 2010 election, and then again in late 2011. As you probably know, many of the major tax cuts passed by Congress during the Bush administration are due to expire. You can keep using that question because they're constantly due to expire. Would you favor, and then there are three options. One is making these tax cuts permanent. That's the Republican position, keep them all in place indefinitely for everybody. Extending the tax cuts for households earning less than $250,000 per year, but letting the tax cuts expire for households earning more than $250,000 per year. That's the president's proposal. And then third, letting all the tax cuts expire as scheduled. You can see the distribution of support. The plurality of support is for the position that the president has been advocating since back when he was candidate Obama on the campaign trail. If you add together the people who want to extend the tax cuts only for the people below a quarter of a million dollars and the people who want to let them all expire, you get a pretty significant majority of people who seem to be in opposition to what the Republicans have been holding out for, which is to keep all the tax cuts in place for everyone. And the proportion of people who support that Republican position 
has declined a little bit over the last few years from about 30% to about 25%. So why isn't that, that we haven't been able to make that policy change in spite of the fact that the president has been pushing it and in spite of the fact that it seems to be pretty popular with ordinary citizens? Well, here's my estimate of the impact of those tax cut preferences. This is measured in late 2011 on estimates of the president's job performance on vote intentions in a matchup between Obama and Romney and in congressional preferences looking ahead to the 2012 congressional elections. And what I'm showing you here is how each of these positions on the tax cuts seems to influence people's political preferences by comparison with people who didn't have any preference one way or the other about the tax cuts. And you can see that the people who support the president's position, who are the people in this middle category, are almost no more likely to support him or to support Democratic candidates for Congress because they hold his positions. The people who are pushing even further, who want to let all the tax cuts expire, are a little more likely to vote for Democrats and to approve of the president's performance. But most of the movement you see in preferences as a result of these kinds of policy views are the people in the top row there, the people who support the Republican position of making all the tax cuts permanent. Those people were about 15% less supportive of President Obama's job performance and about seven percentage points less likely to vote for Obama or to vote for Democrats for Congress. So if you're looking at this issue not in terms of what does the public think, but what is the cost or benefit of taking one position rather than the other, the cost is certainly on the side of pursuing the policies that Obama and Democrats want to pursue but haven't brought themselves to push through uh, at least so far. So I think the important point here is to think about the distinction between what the majority of people or a plurality of people want on one hand and what the electoral incentive for politicians is to pursue one policy rather than another. Um, the Occupy Wall Street movement got a lot of attention over the last year or so, often credited with changing the national conversation with respect to inequality. But it seems to me that it hasn't really succeeded at all in translating disaffection into effective demands for concrete policy change. And this issue of the Bush tax cuts, I think, is a good example of that. Um, not only in the sense that people's preferences about the Bush tax cuts haven't changed very much, but also in the sense that those preferences haven't been translated into political preferences of the kind that politicians might feel compelled to respond to any more than was the case before Occupy Wall Street came along. So colorful, but not very politically consequential, at least so far. So where does that leave contemporary American democracy, going back to Aristotle, or more recently to Robert Dahl, who in his classic book, Who Governs, wrote, in a political system where nearly every adult may vote, but where knowledge, wealth, social position, access to officials, and other resources are unequally distributed, who actually governs? There's been remarkably little research on that fundamental question in political science. Uh, but the good news is that there's been more recently than there had been uh, for many years before. I want to point especially to the work of Martin Gillens at Princeton, who has a new book, was published in August, I guess, uh, called Affluence and Influence, which is a very ambitious study of the relationship between <coughs> policy preferences and policy outcomes through a long swath of American political history. What he does is to look at the preferences of people in the near the top of the income distribution, in the middle, and near the bottom, and to see to what extent their preferences seem to get translated into policy change. The answer, influence over actual policy outcomes, appears to be reserved almost exclusively for those at the top of the income distribution. So there's a correlation between the preferences of middle-income people and policy outcomes. But in cases where middle-income people and affluent people disagree about what the right policy is, the policy is much more likely to move in the direction that affluent people favor 
regardless of the preferences of middle income and poor people. And Gillen says that representational biases of, these, of this magnitude call into question the very democratic character of our society. Um, my book includes some similar analysis, a different setup, uh, looking at different kinds of political behavior, uh, but with, I think, very similar implications. What I did was to look at the voting behavior of U.S. senators and to relate their choices on a whole bunch of bills that come up before Congress, both specific bills and the range of things that they vote on from day to day in Congress, and to relate their choices to the preferences of their constituents, again, looking separately at the views of people at the top of the income distribution, people in the middle, and people at the bottom of the income distribution. And the results are quite similar to the results that Gillen's reported from his study, which is to say that the opinions of people in the bottom third of the income distribution seem to have no real impact on what their senators actually do in Washington. So here are my estimates of the <coughs> impact of preferences of low income, middle income, and high income people in three successive Congresses from the late 1980s and early 1990s. You can see that there's a fair amount of responsiveness to middle income people here, more responsiveness to high income people, less responsiveness to high income people in the third of these Congresses than in the first two. That's at least plausibly attributable to the fact that the first two of these Congresses were under the first President Bush, and the third was the first Congress under Bill Clinton. So with a Democratic president setting the policy agenda, there seems to be somewhat less disparate responsiveness to the views of affluent people. <clears throat> but in all three of these Congresses, no evidence at all of any responsiveness to the views of low-income people. Republicans seem to be especially sensitive to the views of the affluent, but even Democrats seem not to care, or at least not to act on the basis of the preferences of people in the bottom third of the income distribution. So, a fair amount of responsiveness to the middle class from both parties, much more responsiveness to affluent people from the Republicans than from the Democrats, and nobody seems to be doing much about the views of low-income people. So this raises the question, are poor people politically powerless in the American system? I think in one sense the answer is no. If they have a significant say in deciding whether the people who are sitting in those seats are Democrats or Republicans, because the most striking thing about this pattern of connection between public opinion and the policy choices of elected officials is that views of constituents at any level of income seem to matter a good deal less than <coughs> the politicians' own ideological proclivities and their party pressures. So what I'm showing you here is the overall relationship between the behavior of senators from the most liberal at the bottom to the most conservative at the top and the preferences of their constituents in their home states running from the most liberal at the left to the most conservative at the right. And I've shown you here the nature of the relationship for Democratic and Republican senators. You can see that those lines are upward sloping for each group in each Congress, which is to say the Democratic senators with the more liberal constituents take more liberal positions. The Democratic senators with the more conservative constituents take more conservative positions and similarly for Republicans. But the really striking thing here is the gap between the Republicans and Democrats representing constituents with similar political views. And since this was a period in which there were a fair number of states that had a Republican senator and a Democratic senator at the same time, there are lots of instances where we can compare the behavior of two people representing exactly the same constituents and find that their choices, time after time, on significant policy questions are vastly different. So the difference between a Republican and a Democrat representing the same constituents is considerably larger than the difference you would expect between a Democrat representing the most conservative state and a Democrat representing the most liberal state. So it makes a big difference whether you have a D or an R sitting in that seat. And that brings me back to my argument about partisan politics. People of modest means are likely to fare relatively well under Democrats, 
not because Democrats are particularly responsive directly to the policy views of those kinds of people, but more because the Democratic politicians have an ideology and a set of principles that they attempt to put into play when they're in power that generally tend to work in favor of the interests of these people of modest means. So when poor people's votes turn out to be decisive in elections, they're going to be politically influential in that choice between a Democrat and a Republican. But more often, since their votes aren't likely to be decisive most of the time, their political fate is gonna depend on the ideological sympathy of people who aren't themselves poor. And I think that's a problem in our current social context because we've increasingly experienced a kind of social isolation or economic segregation between affluent and poor people in contemporary America. And so to the extent to which economic inequality is exacerbated by racial and ethnic divisions, it seems like it's even less likely that there's gonna be ideological sympathy for the poor among people who are themselves sufficiently powerful in the political system to have real impact on political results. Um, only remarkable emergencies are likely to remind us that we're tied together in this life, in this nation, and that the despair of any touches us all. I don't know if anybody recognizes that quotation. That was from President Bush when he showed up in New Orleans a couple of weeks after Hurricane Katrina. Um, there was a lot of talk in response to that event and the sense of national shame that it engendered that there would be big shifts with respect to policies having to do with inequality. That mostly hasn't turned out to be the case. But since my book appeared, we've experienced another remarkable emergency, the Wall Street meltdown and the Great Recession, and so we have another opportunity to observe the ways in which the political system responds to these kinds of events. And it seems to me that for the most part, the response to the recession has underlined the political and economic resilience of the well-connected. That's certainly not the entire story. If you look, for example, at the kinds of policies that the Obama administration has implemented in order to cushion the shock uh, of the recession on people at the bottom of the distribution, I think there are important benefits there that wouldn't have occurred under a Republican president. But I think it's useful to focus on what's happened for people at the top of the income distribution. This cartoon, I don't know if you can see it or not, is the rescue plan with the firemen putting out the fire in the bank as all the houses around it burned down. One way to think about this, I think, is to think about the kinds of people who are likely to be making policy under these circumstances and the kinds of social networks that they're embedded in and what implications that might have for their perceptions of the world and for what kinds of policy responses might be appropriate. <coughs> Here's a piece that was based on ferreting through the Treasury Secretary's phone records. In the first seven months of his tenure, Geithner's calendar reflects at least 80 contacts with the CEO of Goldman Sachs, the CEO of JP Morgan, uh, Citigroup chairman, Citigroup CEO. Those people are not only the people who run the largest banks or the most troubled banks um, or the ones whose banks were most central to the crisis and most relevant to thinking about what appropriate solutions to the crisis would be, as Simon Johnson noted in his take on these records. Uh, Geithner's phone calls were primarily to and from people he knew well already who had cultivated a relationship with him over the years. So this isn't a case of somebody consciously bringing his ideological acts to bear on the particular policy difficulties that he was facing, but rather somebody who saw that we were in a heap of trouble and looked around and talked to people he knew and respected to find out what the right policy solutions would be. And they gave him the kinds of policy solutions, mostly, that you might expect those kinds of people to produce. As a result, in part, of these kinds of policies, um, the upturn that I showed you in the very first graph about the share of income going to wealthy people. Uh, although they took a big hit in 2008 and 2009 as the stock market plunged, as I suggested, they're starting to come back, uh, doing pretty well again these days. So if you were worried about them, 93% uh, of the income gains in the first year of the recovery, that is in calendar 2010. 
uh, were accrued by people in the top 1% of the income distribution whose incomes grew by almost 12%, while the incomes of people in the bottom 99% grew by uh, less than 1%. So still an unequal democracy, and in spite of everything that's happened in the last four years, I think uh, no less gilded than it was when I wrote about it. Thank you. I can point to them. I can point to them. Okay. People have questions? Yes. Okay, here's my very short political history of the Democratic Party. Through most of the 20th century, the Democratic Party was as liberal as it could be without pissing off the Southern racists. And now it's as liberal as it can be without pissing off Wall Street. And on balance, I think that's probably a change for the better. Okay, so the first question was about shifts in the ideology of the Democratic Party over time and how they're relevant. I think they have shifted in important ways that are important to this story, but the Republican Party has shifted at least as far and probably further in the same direction, and so I think that's had relatively little impact on the divergence between the two parties, which you would expect to be important to thinking about what kinds of policy outcomes each of them would produce. Yes, sir. It's not so much a decline in inequality as, I mean, a decline in inequality as a decline in the overall level of growth under Democratic presidents. I think it has mostly to do with differences in what the two parties are trying to accomplish earlier in their term. Those partisan differences that I showed you are biggest in the second year of each administration. And the way I think about that is a new president comes in has a political honeymoon, has a lot of opportunity to try and engage in policy change in the first year of his administration, that produces distinctive policy outcomes and economic experiences largely in the second year of each administration. And so the biggest partisan differences you see are in the, those second years. Under Democrats, that second year is usually a big economic boom. Under Republicans, it's usually a recession. Um, and then what happens as you go forward through the rest of the term? Well, under Democratic presidents, the boom doesn't last forever. Things begin to slow down, and by the time the next election comes around, economic growth is much more anemic than it was earlier in the president's term. Under Republicans, we grow our way out of the recession as the president's term goes along, and by the time the election comes around, things are going pretty well. So under Ronald Reagan, for example, big commercials, morning in America, everybody felt good about how things were going in 1984. There was more economic growth in 1984 than there was in the rest of Reagan's first term, and also more economic growth in 1984 than there was in Reagan's entire second term. Um, that's an exaggerated example, but I think the pattern is one that appears pretty consistently across administrations. And so then people say, well, why aren't Democrats smart enough to figure this out and wait and produce the boom in year four rather than in year two? Partly I think that's very difficult to do just because moving these levers and getting policy responses and economic changes is difficult, but also because I think most presidents recognize that they're gonna have less political capital in year three than they have in year one, and so 
if what you want to do is to stimulate the economy and make things good for working people, you're likely to do it when you have a chance rather than to wait and hope that you'll still be able to do it a couple of years later. Yes, ma'am. Um, does voting behavior stay the same when Congress is concerned? And if so, uh, if, if that's correct, and I think I understand you, then aren't we doomed to a lot of divided government in the sense that the midterms would reflect recent experiences of income growth or uh, and then with the lags and so on, aren't we then likely to see counter cyclical trends in congressional voting, uh, thereby hamstringing the president in the second part of, of every term? There are often counter cyclical shifts in midterm elections. So one of the things that political scientists have talked about for decades is the midterm curse, the fact that the president's party almost always loses seats in midterm congressional elections. I think that's one of the reasons why presidents recognize that they're more likely to be successful in changing policy in the first half of their administration than they are in the second half of their administration. I should also say that the response to economic conditions in the election year seems to be less in congressional elections than it is in presidential elections, partly because there are other things that are influencing these local races in different parts of the country, um, partly because candidates are often trying to run away from the record of the administration in ways that are harder for the president himself to do. Um, but also because the response here is not, as you might think, to reward or punish incumbents of both parties if things are going well or badly, but rather to reward or punish the president's party. And that's what gives the incumbents of the out party the political incentive to make sure that things aren't going well when the election comes around. Because even if they're in some sense responsible for the policy outcome, they're likely to be uh, benefited by the fact that voters reward or punish the other party rather than them. It's a unfortunate feature of the political system that we have that I think has been increasingly exploited by the parties. Uh, how do you reconcile all the evidence that these voters have seen to imply uh, Democrats or Democratic presidents are better accommodating those and low income voters with some evidence that shows that uh, entitlement programs have grown about 8 percentage points more under Republican presidents than under Democratic presidents, which are ostensibly supposed to help low income Um most of the programs that we count as entitlement programs are not programs that are aimed disproportionately at low-income people. Um, the ones that are often do well under Republican presidents, not because the Republican presidents implement policy changes that are to the benefit of those people, but rather just because the amount of benefits that go to people is directly triggered by the economic circumstances. So when you have a big recession, that's bad for people at the bottom of the distribution, it's automatically gonna kick in things like unemployment insurance. Uh, so, for example, the first two years of President Reagan's first term looked like a period in which government transfers to low-income people were actually higher than they had been for quite some time. That wasn't because Reagan was pulling levers in order to produce better government responsiveness to the needs of poor people. It was because these formulas for giving people unemployment insurance uh, kicked in automatically as a result of the recession that Reagan presided over in his first couple of years. Sir. Yeah, the question was about evangelical Christians and their shifts in their political views. 
there are lots of groups that have shifted their preferences from Democrat to Republican or vice versa over periods of time. And in the last 20 years, I guess, it's certainly true that evangelical Christians as a group have moved from uh, basically pretty evenly divided between the two parties to being pretty consistently Republican. I think the stereotype is that those are disproportionately working class people, and the fact is that they're not, that religious people in general and evangelicals among them are on average a little more affluent than the rest of uh, society is. So that is an important shift and it helps to account for why the Republicans have done better. Again, I think it's misleading to think about that shift without thinking about the counteracting shifts in the other directions, right? So by taking positions that appeal to evangelical Christians, the Republican Party has succeeded in alienating lots of other people who are more liberal in their social views. So we don't have a book about what happened to the Republican Party in the Northeast, but what happened to the Republican Party in the Northeast is that it disappeared because the Republicans were busy trying to woo these people with different kinds of views. So um, there's been shifts. That's one of the shifts that has worked in the Republicans' advantage, but what the net effect of taking those policy positions rather than others would be, I think, is hard to sort out. Sir. Um, I don't think of inequality itself as being a actionable issue in the sense that it's going to rouse people to some major political shift. I think if there's a shift, it's going to come from people's sense of frustration with their absolute circumstances and with their movement in the, up the economic ladder relative to their own previous experience or their expectations based on their families and the people they see around them more than it is abstract numbers about the Gini coefficient and how it's changed over time. Um, when people ask me what the politics are of how we get out of this, my answer is that I don't know. I can't tell you what a program would be that would produce a big change in the pattern that we're observing now. On the other hand, we have had these previous historical instances of big increases in economic inequality and did see in those cases political responses that over a period of time produced a change in direction. I don't know what we can if infer from those experiences in the way of lessons for the current period that it might actually produce a reliable political program, but there is reason to believe that we aren't necessarily stuck forever with the kind of pattern that we see now. Yes. Uh, why do you think American politics, uh, including the choices of uh, elected Democratic representatives, are more responsive to the affluent, not responsive at all to what people in the lowest area? Is that just a matter of campaign contributions? And uh, what does your diagnosis suggest about? Uh, ways in which this could be changed through policy or through uh, political activity, including intra-party activity, so that American politics becomes well, more democratic. In a way, I think that was the same question that I ducked a minute ago. Um, and I'm going to continue to duck it. I can say a little bit about what I think is going on, but less about how to change it. Um, I think the campaign finance system has contributed to this, but I don't think it's the major part of the problem by any stretch. I think it's important to realize that this idea that we could somehow carve off the political system and treat it as a domain that was entirely isolated and insulated from the economic system and have free market capitalism and big differences in economic success on one side but have a political system that was somehow pristinely insulated from that is not very likely. 
um, that the political system is one that's likely to respond in one way or another to differences in the political power of different kinds of people as it did in Aristotle's day before we had campaign finance regulations and uh, as it did in Machiavelli's day. Um, money and economic resources are one of the things that people can bring to bear on the political process if they're sufficiently concerned about where the process is heading and what the implications for their well-being are. Votes are another resource. Um, engagement in political issues and ringing doorbells, another resource. Um, all these things, bombs and rockets, if people are sufficiently unhappy with how things are going to go out and you know, bomb government offices, that's something that the political system is going to respond to. Um, all those things are resources that people can bring to bear. The economic resources, I think, are likely to be important in a whole variety of ways in any political system. And so that's what leads me to believe that as economic inequality increases, the political problems uh, we're pointing at here, uh, the political inequality is likely to increase more or less in tandem. We can fiddle with that in some particular domains. I think campaign finance is probably not a very promising one at the moment just because the Supreme Court has ruled out so many possible approaches to that particular kind of problem. Um, another thing I should say is that the experiences of the people who are making policy are likely to be important. I tried to get at that with my little thing about Tim Geithner's phone records, uh, but one of my former students, Nicholas Carnes, who's now at the Duke Policy School, has done a really interesting study looking at the backgrounds of elected officials and showing how the experiences that they have in their pre-political life influence their views about economic policy issues especially. And so it's not so much the fact that some members of Congress are really rich that seems to matter. It's not that they came from wealthy families that seems to matter. What mostly matters in his tabulation is having had some experience working at a blue collar job at some point in life. Um, the argument, I guess, would be that that experience changes people's perceptions in a way that's likely to be fairly enduring. And so it would suggest that opening up avenues of political advancement for a wider range of people might have in some important implications for what we got in the way of policy, even holding constant all the pressures that are placed on them when they actually get to Washington. Sir. Uh, this number would be the best one to look at in terms of the overall economy. I was thinking about the fourth year, that fourth year graph. Mm -hmm. These are all fourth years for the entire electorate. This is broken down by income level. Yeah, that was what I was thinking of. So yeah. The answer is yes. Voters are remarkably sensitive to relatively small changes in income. I think probably not so much because they actually experience a richer life as a result of having an extra 1% real income, but because they have a sense of whether the country as a whole is going well or badly. And if they think it's going well, that spills over in ways some of which are conscious and rational, and some of which are unconscious and irrational, into thinking that the person who's in charge deserves to stay in charge, or that the party that's in charge deserves to stay in charge. So the idea is I, I make an extra 500 bucks a year, and that then makes me feel good about these other things? Well, it's not so much your own 500 bucks as it is a general perception that the country is prospering, that it's morning in America, as Reagan's ads say, which make people feel better about the country, make people feel better about the government, make people feel better about the president than they would otherwise.
And the fact that they focus so much on the current period rather than over the entire course of the administration, I think, underlines the extent to which this is really a pretty random process. I think it would be hard to argue that a good test of President Obama's performance in office is whether the change in real income over the second and third quarters of 2012 is 2% 2 or 1% or half a percent, but that's going to have a huge impact on the election. Um, each, overall, each one percentage point increase in income growth, the measure that I'm using in this picture, matters about as much as the biggest difference that we've been able to observe in ideological postures between any of the presidential candidates that we've observed over this period. So the difference between a moderate and an extremist presidential candidate is likely to be two or three percentage points. Yes? Um, first, on your last point about the history, this study by Nick Carnes that I referred to, the current proportion of people in Congress who spent, this is not who spent some of their pre-political career in blue collar backgrounds, but who worked mostly in blue collar occupations before they got into politics is on the order of three or four percent. If you look back over the entire course of the 20th century, it appears as though that number has ranged between about three and four percent. Um, so the idea that we used to have a political system in which ordinary people would just raise through the ranks and end up in Congress um, was pretty mythical. The exceptions were mostly people who started out in blue collar jobs and then went into union politics and went from union politics into Democratic Party politics. But even they typically spent more time as union organizers than they did actually on the factory floor. Um, in terms of responsiveness to different kinds of people's policy views, I don't think we have a good sense of the extent to which these differences reflect conscious decisions to pay more attention to some people than to others, or differences in the communication networks of different kinds of elected officials, how likely they are to hear from different kinds of citizens or what exactly that is. But what I want to emphasize is that those levels of responsiveness that I estimated and showed to you are over and above the overall ideological difference between Democrats and Republicans. So the huge difference is between what all Democrats on one hand are doing and what all Republicans on the other hand are doing. And then at the margin beyond that, they're influenced some by the views of their constituents and mostly by the views of their affluent constituents. Um, what strikes me about, uh, about this story is that it's very much driven by, by presence. Uh, so uh, the earlier graphs that we're showing are these like, quite dramatic differences between various like, you know, Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. But this is kind of puzzling to me because uh, certainly we think of presidents in the political science literature as being fairly weak uh, and Congress as being really the driver of policy change. And in these periods, 
Yeah, I think that's been true for much of this period that I've looked at, although I think it's less true now than it used to be. There's been increasing polarization and increasingly conscious resistance among the minority party to what the majority party is trying to accomplish. And so, as I tried to say in talking about Obama's legislative achievements, every one of them was pushed exactly to the limit of what the 60th most liberal senator would put up with and no further. So, in that sense, certainly Congress had important implications for the nature of the policies that were adopted. Mostly those seem to be less important, I think in part because we're mostly not at that particular kind of margin in the pushing and hauling about policy making to the extent that we have been in the last half dozen years or so. Um, I have looked at whether these patterns that I have examined differ between Democrats and Republicans in Congress, or rather whether the partisan makeup of Congress has any independent influence on policy outcomes. The evidence suggests that there may be some, but that it's much smaller than for presidents. And it's hard to tell for sure because in this period that I studied, almost the entire first two thirds of the period were Democratic majorities in the House. Um, and the last period was unbroken Republican majorities until the most recent turnarounds back and forth, which wouldn't be in the data set that I used for the book. And because of that pattern of non-turnover, it's very hard to distinguish the effect of shifts, especially in majority control of Congress, from anything else that changes over a long period of time. So any changes in the economic world or in the social world that occur gradually over a long period of time would be potentially confounded with these changes from a Democratic majority to a Republican majority. And so it becomes very hard to sort out. Whereas with presidents, we have enough alternation back and forth that we can rule out with a fair amount of reliability the possibility that these differences are just due to shifts over time in the structure of families or changes in the nature of the occupations and what kinds of people are going to work or changes in technology over long periods of time and that kind of thing. So it's just harder to get a handle on Congress, but insofar as we have one, it looks like there are effects that are consistent with these story, but much smaller. Ma'am. Um, I'm not sure which particular survey results you're referring to, so I don't know. My guess, my general sense is that there's been no very evident trend one way or the other in the views of these kinds of people relative to others. In fact, there was a big survey that just came out last week that emphasized the fact that there's a huge amount of heterogeneity within the white working class um, that in the South, Romney is ahead of Obama by 20 percentage points or something like that, whereas in the West and the Northeast, they're pretty close to being tied. So um, it's not even obvious to me that that's a very useful category for electoral analysis, but insofar as it is. Well, I'm not sure exactly what it is that you're comparing to what here. The 2008 Obama vote was generally already lower in rural areas by comparison to previous Democratic votes. But yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look at the data in order to get a good sense. Everything that I've seen, though, suggests that those people are less focused on social issues than better educated people are. <laughs> 